Psalm 31, and we ask the question, have you ever been in a situation where you thought, this is it, this is the end? Uh, maybe you were in an accident, or maybe you had some a physical scare, or maybe it was just a situation that you said, this is going to end badly, thank you. This is, there's a no hope for this situation, it's going to end badly, it's gonna be bad. And you thought, this is it. We've all had different times like that for different reasons and to different degrees, but this is the feeling that David was having as he wrote this psalm, Psalm 31. It says in verse 1, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this uh, scripture that you've given to us, for our encouragement, for edification, and for admonition. And we thank you for how you worked in the life of your servant David, and I pray you'd work the same way in each one of our hearts. And we ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll hold your place there in Psalm 31 and go back to 1 Samuel 23, uh, we, even, even 22, 1 Samuel 22, uh, with many of the Psalms, there's the backdrop of something in David's life that was going on when the Psalm was penned or about which the Psalm was penned. And it seems that this is the situation that David was in. Uh, because of some words that are used, though he doesn't say it directly, it seems pretty apparent that this is the situation that he was in. But in 1 Samuel chapter 22, we find Saul pursuing David. And in verse 5, the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hold, depart and get thee into the land of Judah. Then David departed and he came to the forest of Hereth. When Saul heard that David was discovered and the men that were with him, now Saul abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Then said Saul unto his servants that stood about him, Hear now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me, and there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse, that is, Jonathan had made a league with the son of Jesse, David, and there is none of you that is sorry for me, or showeth unto me that my son hath stirred up my servants against me to lie in wait as at this day. And so Saul is trying to put uh, these men on a guilt trip and telling them, uh, you, none of you men are sorry for me and you guys have been conspiring against me and you've been laying in wait for me. Uh, is that really what was happening? Was David laying in wait for Saul? No, Saul was lying in wait for David. That's what he was doing under the tree with his spear in his hand. He was trying to find David, but he has turned everything on its head and decided to try to twist the truth so that it made these people think better of Saul and less of David, try to paint David as the immoral one and Saul as the righteous one. And so he said, uh, uh, David's lying in wait. And he said, you, got, you, you haven't told me, you didn't tell me that Jonathan, my son, made a covenant with him. Then answered Doag the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of... Ahitib. And so uh, this is uh, the situation where David went and he was given the sword of Goliath. You remember that? Ahimelech, the priest, gave him the sword of Goliath. And he, that is Ahimelech, inquired of the Lord for him, that is David, and gave him vittles and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. So Doeg is a rat. And Doeg has given to Saul information regarding David, who had been anointed by the Lord to be king. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitib, and all his father's house, the priests that were in Nob, and they came all of them to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitib. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said unto him, Why have ye conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, and that thou hast, hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him? that he should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day. Do you see how he's lying about David? Saying David's the one lying in wait, and really Saul is the one who's pursuing him, and he's chasing him from place to place, a hither and yon, trying to capture him and trying to bring him to a place of death so that he would not take Saul's kingdom, though God had already anointed him to that. 
So you have the pot calling the kettle black and even worse because the, the kettle's not really black in this case. David's righteous, David's doing right, and Saul is calling him unrighteous and he's trying to turn everybody against David, saying David is unrighteous, I am righteous. I'm the one who's fearing the Lord, David is not. David is going against the Lord's anointed. I am the one who is trying to do justice. Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thy house? And Ahimelech had a wise answer here for the king. And he said, he's trying to get the king to think about what he's doing. He's trying to take this narrative that the king is falsely spreading, and he's trying to say, listen, this is actually what's happening. Trying to change it, trying to, trying to confront that thinking. Then Ahimelech, or, uh, and then he says in verse 15, Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father, for thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And he said, you're, and you're, you're, you're trying to accuse me of, of, uh, of helping David against you, and I, that's not what I was doing. I wasn't helping David to try to lie in wait against you. You're accusing, you're falsely accusing me. And you're also falsely accusing my entire father's house, uh, not just me. Amazing. Verse 16, and the king said, thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. Now, Saul defending his quote-unquote righteousness, his self-righteousness, now he's going to do something really wicked and evil. And he is told to him like that he's going to kill him. And the king said unto the footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. So they said, Kill the priests. Ahimelech and his father's house, kill all the priests, because they didn't uh, betray David like Doeg did. For the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall on the priests of the Lord. They had more scruples than he did. And they said, no, we're not going to do this thing. Just because you've decided that he's unrighteous doesn't mean that he actually is. And just because you've decided that the priest should die doesn't mean we're going to raise our hand against the priest. They had some fear of God still in their lives. And the king said to Doeg, turn thou and fall upon the priest, priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned and he fell upon the priests and slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. Eighty-five priests Doeg killed on that day. What a wicked, wicked man. Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, oxen and asses, and sheep with the edge of the sword. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahedab, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. So this was one of those who should have died with the eighty-five escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priests. And David said unto Abiathar, I, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul. David said, I knew it. Doeg was a bad guy and I knew it. There was nothing I could do about it, but I knew it. He was, gonna, he was like this. And David said, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. David felt some responsibility that those 85 were killed. And the, and the rest of them that were killed from verse 19. And so David said to Abiathar, Abide thou with me, fear not, for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life. But with me thou shalt be in safeguard. At least we'll be together. And it's good to have a partner when you're under the gun like that. But chapter 23, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. So David goes down to Keilah, and he rescues Keilah. And then he has to ask the Lord, Are the men of Keilah going to betray me? See, so Doeg betrayed him. And went a step further, trying to, to profit financially and physically and in every way off of uh, the betrayal of David and killed these people and spoiled them. And then the Lord says to David, yes, the men of Keilah will betray you too. So David has to run from Keilah. In verse 14 of chapter 23, David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day. But God delivered him not into his hand. Saul sought him every day. That was what Saul was doing. That was his life's goal. That was his passion to try to kill David. He sought him every day. Forget running the kingdom. I've got to go kill David. That was his goal. 
So David is running for his life day by day because Saul is continually chasing him. Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee. Thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. And that also Saul my father knoweth. And they two made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. Then came up the Ziphites to Saul to Gibeah. He's going to be betrayed again. Three times in a row, he's betrayed. First, Doag betrays him. Then the Kila, uh, the men of Kila betray him. And now the Ziphites betray him. They go to Saul. He's in the wilderness of Ziph. And the Ziphites go to Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself with us in strongholds in the woods in the hill of Hakila, Hak which is on the south of Jeshimon? Now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of thy soul to come down. And our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. And Saul said, Blessed be ye of the Lord, his feigned spirituality, for ye have compassion on me. He said to Doeg and those men, he said, uh, who is, has pity on me? Now he wants compassion. And those who uh, are really are, are attacking the Lord, they usually want some kind of pity. They want kind of, some kind of passion. They're trying to appeal to emotion. And we see the left doing this in uh, politics today, appealing to emotion. And... Uh, in, a, in this way, and it's a deceitful way of doing business. But he says in verse 22, Go, I pray, you prepare yet, and know and see his place where his haunt is, and who hath seen him there, for it is told me that he deals very subtly. So David's really good at hiding, so you guys need to do some spying, and you need to find out where he's actually at, and then you can send a messenger to tell me. See, therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself. Look at, try to find which place he's going to go to if he's one place is discovered. I want to know the whole operation that he has. I want to know all of his hiding spots so that when I go to one place and I don't find him there, I know I can go check the other place and he'll be in that place. Yeah. See therefore and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself. And come ye again to me with certainty and I will go with you. And it shall come to pass if he be in the land that I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Jude. I'll, find, I'll be able to look at all these places where he hides, all of his haunts, all of his lurking places. And I'll be able to find David. They arose and went as if before Saul, but David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain in the south of Jeshimon. Saul, uh, uh, Saul also and his men went to seek him. And they told David, wherefore he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. So David is circulating around at these different hiding spots, and the noose is tightening around David as Saul is finding all of his hiding spots from the Ziphites. And now he's being blocked into this place in Maon. And Saul went on this side of the mountain, verse 26, and David and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. For Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them. So Saul is just on the other side of the hill. And they've got David's men completely surrounded and there's no place for him to go. And he realizes that this is it. There's no place for us to go. We're going to be captured and I'm going to be killed. And yes, we could say, well, David was anointed to be king. Yes, David knew that he had been anointed a king. But physically speaking, all he can see with his eyes is that he's surrounded and that, Dave, that Saul is, going about, is about to crest the hill with his army and I'm going to be killed. This is what is going to happen. And there's no reason he should think otherwise. And Psalm 31 is a description of how David felt and what was going on in David's heart, his commun communion with the Lord on the basis of this position when he basically thought, this is it. This is it. There's no hope. I'm going to be dying here. This is the end of things. But I want you to see the trust that David had. Come back to Psalm 31. He says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Remember, Saul was trying to basically uh, impugn David's character and say that David was unrighteous and that he was righteous. And David said, you know what, Lord, I don't claim even my own righteousness. I'm trusting in your righteousness. I need to be delivered by your righteousness. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. That word speedily lets us know that David was saying, this is an emergency situation. There is nothing that is, can help me out of this situation, and I need help right now. They, Saul is just on the other side of the mountain, 
and we're surrounded and they know where we are, generally they're going to they're gonna get us. We're in trouble. So deliver me speedily. This was his prayer to the Lord at that time. And notice he said, For thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me. These people have gone and said, We'll be the people who tell you uh, that's what, that will be our part. And they've laid a trap. They've laid a net for David and for his men. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. And then he says in verse 5, Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Really amazing statement here for David to make. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And this is because David was at the point of recognizing this is it. There is nothing physically I can do. I can't run backwards, I can't run forwards, I can't run left, and I can't run right. There is no way that I can go. I am about to be destroyed. And so he said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He didn't have any expectation of actually becoming the king of the rest of the land, the rest of the land acknowledging him as king. He had no expectation of that. He is about to die, and he knows it. And so he said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. So how do you know that he expected to die there? Well, because this same phrase, this verse was quoted by two others. Both of those who were killed. The first one is the Lord Jesus in the book of Luke. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Chapter 23, let's turn there. In verse 46, when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Was Jesus delivered from that death? What about Acts chapter 7? What about Acts chapter 7? Acts chapter 7. Verse 59, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So both of them calling upon Psalm 31 in their dying moments. Both of these who were being killed because of their relationship with the Father, Jesus Christ, and, and uh, Stephen, both of them being killed. So they did not, they were not able to see the deliverance physically in their lives. Physically speaking, they were not delivered. And David had no expectation of physically being delivered. He thought, this is it. I'm going to die. He said, into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. And this is his statement of his conscience before the Lord. I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. Saul's been spreading all kinds of lies, and he's forsaking his own mercy, as Jonah says about lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble, thou hast known my soul in adversities. I like that phrase, thou hast known my soul in adversities. When we go through adversities like this, God knows exactly what's going on, and he knows us better than we could know ourselves. He knows their situation way better than we could know the situation Spurgeon said on this verse, know thyself is a good philosophic precept, but thou art known of God is a superlative consolation. And that's the truth. We focus on uh, having the best way forward, knowing our way out of things, but God knows us. What a blessing. Thou hast known my soul in adversities. Notice what he says in verse 8, and hast not shut me up into the hands of the enemy, thou hast set my feet in a large room. So as the noose is tightening around David, David says, thou hast not shut me up in the hand of the enemy, thou hast set my feet in a large room. Really, it feels like the pressure is on, but in the Lord, I have tons of space. I can stretch out. I'm in a large room. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief, yea, my soul and my belly. And now he uh, uses these body parts, parts of our makeup 
to demonstrate his sorrow and his grief. And we can identify with all of these things. Mine eye is consumed with grief. Don't we shed tears in time of trouble? Certainly we do. There are some times where we would say our soul hurts or aches or is grieved. As he says here, my soul is consumed with grief and my belly. Sometimes we're sick to our stomach because of the difficulty of the situation, the heaviness of it. For my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. I'm so tired of this running from Saul day by day into the mountains, over to the next cave, to the next place, dealing with betrayal. My life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. I'm looking for thy righteousness, as he says in verse 1. Not my own righteousness, I have iniquity. I was a, I was a reproach among all mine enemies, but especially among my neighbors. He's, he was betrayed over and over again. Those who, who, who he thought would be a blessing to him, those who he thought would be kind to him, those who he thought would shelter him. His neighbors and a fear to mine acquaintance, they that did see me without fled from me. They looked through the window and they saw David coming down the road. They ran out the back door. They didn't want to be home when David came around. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I am like a broken vessel, just cast aside, no use, no purpose. For I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. Whilst they took counsel, while they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my God. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Save me for thy mercy's sake. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon thee. Instead, let the wicked be ashamed and let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. And here he's talking about Saul and those who were saying that David was actually against the Lord, as if they were righteous and he was not. This is slander. This was not true. Lying lips, let them be put to silence. And he said, they speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. Who today speaks proudly and contemptuously against the righteous? Isn't there the accuser of the brethren who accuses us night and day? And God one day is going to cast him down. He's going to destroy him. He is going to, as David prayed in verse 18, be put to silence. But then he reverses his mind in verse 19. He says, Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Those who trust in the Lord instead of in the sons of men, we have something laid up for us. And David is in a situation where he's, he's thinking and realizing these things that are here that we've laid up for ourselves, they're not lasting, but God has laid up something for me. And I haven't received it yet, but God has laid up something for me and I can trust in him and he, is, he has great goodness. And his goodness is expressed to me in that which we has, he has laid up for me. And he has not just laid it up for me, but he has wrought it. The words for, uh, the, uh, he has worked it for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Verse 20, thou shalt hide them those that trust in thee, thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. So God said, or, or David said of the Lord in verse 19, them that trust in thee are going to experience the goodness of God that has been laid up for them. See, God has good things kept for us. He has good things kept up for us, kept for us, guarded for us, preserved for us, reserved for us. But the same Hebrew word is used when he says in verse 20, thou shalt hide them, that is the people, in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. So the same word is used for laid up in verse 19 as is used for hide them in verse 20. So in verse 19, God is keeping things for us. In this case, for David. In verse 20, God is keeping David from the enemy. Do you see that? He, he keeps things for us. He preserves things for us. He hides things for us. And he hides us from things. He keeps us from things. This is what the Lord does. Ultimately, the thing that the Lord keeps us from is death and hell, judgment. That's the last enemy that shall be destroyed, death. But even right now, and ultimately, God is keeping for us. What did he say in the book of John in my Father's house are many mansions. 
I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, as he says in verse 20, in verse 19, those things which thou hast wrought for them or prepared for them, worked for them, made for them. Verse 21, blessed be the Lord, for he hath showed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. I want you to see verse 22, for I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. And this is kind of a looking back statement as he was able to experience the Lord's uh, provision. I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. There is no hope. The Lord is not watching. Uh, he can't see what's going on here. I'm going to be extinguished, and, but I still trust in him. But go back to 1 Samuel 23. Verse 26, Saul went on this side of the mountain and David and his men on that side of the mountain and David, notice it, made haste to get away for fear of Saul. For Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them. Same exact word used in 1 Samuel 23 for haste there. Uh, by the way, in verse 27, the word, English word haste comes up again, but that's a different one. That's a different one. But the same one is used in verse 19, uh, I mean verse 26, and over here in uh, Psalm 31 and verse 22. This is when David is in his haste. David is making haste. And when we are hasty, when we're in fear, when we're about to be overwhelmed and overcome, sometimes we think, well, this is it, and there's no hope, there's no deliverance coming. And that's what David said to himself. This is, this is it. There's no deliverance coming. Many times we get in that mode, don't we? We, we, can, we should recognize that oftentimes God will bring deliverance physically and in this life. Even when we could least expect it and there's no way that it should happen, God can bring it. But ultimately, just like the Lord Jesus and Stephen, we can say, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Because we will be delivered. And these things are just as true as he says in, 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 uh, as it says in 1 Samuel 23 again and verse 27. Look what the Lord did. But there came a messenger unto Saul, just as Saul is about to tighten the noose for the last inch. There came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste thee and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Do you think the Lord allowed that at just the right time? Wherefore, Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, they called that place Selahema Lakoth, something like that, okay? You know what that means? It means rock of escape. Rock of escape. Come back to Psalm 31. Because in verse 2, he had said, Bow down thine ear to me, deliver me speedily, be thou my strong rock, for an house of defense to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. The Lord is our rock, and he's our rock of escape, not just our rock of defense. Because of all of these things, we should say with David in verse 23 and 24, O love the Lord, all ye his saints. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hopeth in the Lord. And the Lord gives three statements regarding his people. He calls them saints, he calls them faithful, and he calls them those that hope in the Lord. That's what we need to do in trial. In time of trial, in time of difficulty, we, we need to remember that we're his saints. We're God's people. We're God's chosen people. We need to continue to be faithful to him, and we need to continue to hope in the Lord. Then we can be of good courage and know that he will strengthen our heart. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. And lastly, as we close, three things that the Lord does. He preserveth the faithful. He plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. So he rewards the good. He punishes the evil. And then he says, he shall strengthen thine heart. He shall strengthen thine heart. So God will reward us for doing good, and he will reward them for doing bad and he'll ultimately strengthen us. We'll be victorious over these things. We can trust the Lord 
Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the blessing that this passage was to me this week. I pray that you use it in the hearts of each one of God's people as we think about this passage in time to come, and even tonight, as uh, different burdens and trials are, are, are uh, represented here, some with family members going through difficulties, some going through difficulties themselves. Lord, I pray your mercy and comfort for each situation, for your strength that's necessary uh, to go on to take the next step. I pray you'd help us to be remembering that we're your saints. Uh, we belong to you. We've been chosen by you. Help us remember to be faithful and to not be dissuaded from serving you and help us to have hope in you so that we can have good courage. And we look for that strengthening of our heart that you'll bring. We thank you, Lord, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.